<clears throat> I appreciate uh, Brother Jake uh, asking me to preach. He didn't ask me, but he, we agreed, and he told me um, uh, that he'd like to have me speak this morning, and so I am pleased to do that. Take your Bibles, please. Turn to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. Now, the first a few verses, uh, Matthew 18, 21. Thank you for that offertory, Miss Jennifer. Near the cross. Near the cross. Matthew 18. The first um, two verses are familiar to you. I, I want to say this, too. I am... Uh, Tuesday, I have, I hope, one of the last appointments with the dental surgeon slash dentist. Um, I, I went in, I had, I had, oh man, I had a, a crown, I had a, uh, a root canal, I had um, a bridge, I had a cavity or two. So I went in the dentist and said, I, I need to get everything squared away. And I had some insurance that could help me with partially... And so I went in, they did these tests, and they, they said, man, you have one of your front tooth, front teeth um, is not even connected to bone. It's just hanging there. And so I'm like, well, so what's the problem? They said, well, it's not connected, but it could come out at any time. It could hurt. It could not hurt. We don't know. It's just not connected. And they showed me some x-rays. And then, you know, I, I'm not like everybody has this nowadays, degenerative disc disease. Everybody has fibromyalgia. Everybody has some kind of, you know, something. So I didn't buy into it when a doctor told me about my neck, when I have, have neck uh, problems. Um, but the dentist said, you, you have significant bone loss. So we made a decision, which I didn't want to do, and I put it off for several months, that I had to have all these teeth taken out. Now, it is an embarrassment to me. It is a speech impediment. I am slurring my word. I hate that. I don't like doing it. I've been a public speaker for a long time. Um, here's another thing about that. The reason I have this massive beard is to sort of like deflect from this until I get these repaired. I have all these uh, weird. Well, I have one missing. I'll get that fixed. But all these are squared away for whatever reason. You know, I, I'm not sure exactly why. I don't care. I just know what I'm dealing with. So um, bear with me as I slur my uh, words, as I read, I'm not gonna hold back. It seemed like the Lord said to me when I was, I knew well, this was gonna be in my future and in my present. Um, and I don't know how much more, how long until everything squared away, <clears throat> but I felt some uh, trepidation about getting up and preaching, getting up and speaking, going soul winning and talking to people. Uh, but the Lord, you know, you know how the Lord's like, yep, that's true. Um, you can't put up a little embarrassment for me, but I went to the cross for you. Now, he doesn't even have to go that far with me, it's, and he shouldn't have to go that far with anyone. So here I am. Here you are. You're going to have to endure it. And then secondly, I can't wait to shave this junk off my face. I, it doesn't, everybody that tells me, you look old. Everybody that Mrs. Brown came over the house. Man, she said, you're looking rough. I'm like, <laughs> Miss, Miss Julie, Miss Pip. Well, preacher, when are you going to shave? You look old. Mrs. Jackson, I'm not kissing you until you shave. And um, uh, others uh, of you that have been so kind uh, to talk, and then you that show me up, and you that show me up, and you that show me up, and you that show me up. I, w I just want to tell you four men, I hate every one of your guts, okay? <laughs> My son-in-law, Alex Schultz, there's Alex back there. I mean, he can grow a beard and like, he can shave on Monday. By Friday, it looks like, you know. It's crazy. I can't grow a beard, um, unless you want to call this a beard. Um, so bear with me, please, uh, th and thank you for your patience. All right, Matthew chapter 18, verse number uh, 21. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven times, Jesus saith unto him, I say, uh, not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven, basically every day. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him ten thousand talents. Now a talent was uh, was a, a weight. A, a talent, that's how they weighed it. They had scales. That's why God talks about an, un, an unjust scale. is an abomination to him. You're cheating people. 
uh, putting your thumb on the scale, as it were. Um, and it says, uh, so gold, the, the weight that, that the best I could ascertain is 40 million, four zero million dollars. So there's, there, here's this guy, a servant, owes his Lord $40 million. Okay, he can never pay. Okay, it, it, that's why there's some why abstract number. For, if the IRS showed up today and said, you owe $40 million, you'd say, first of all, I'm not sure what choice were unchurch words would come out of your mouth. Uh, but secondly, you know, and if it was true at our at our median level incomes or wherever we are, uh, we could never pay $40 million. So the IRS came and said, you owe $40 million. Here's what you could be able to say. But for as much as he, I, you, had not to pay, his Lord commanded him, commanded him to be sold, and his wife and his children, all that he had, and payment to be made. Now, obviously, his wife, his kids, and all that he had couldn't equal 40 minutes, so he can never pay the debt. Number one, he can't pay it. Number two, he's got to sell his wife, his kids, and all that he had, and try and put a, 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 a pebble in the ocean to pay the bill. Um, verse 20. Six. The servant therefore fell down and worshiped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Now, look at me real quick and answer me. Could the guy pay $40 million? Yes or no? No. Did the, the, did the Lord, uh, did the, 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 uh, 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 the debtor say, I'll pay thee all, knowing that he couldn't pay all? Yes or no? Yes. He couldn't pay it all. And did the Lord know he can't pay me all? Yes or no? Yes, the Lord knew. But we'll see the result of this, this good Lord. Verse 27, then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. Uh, but the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. That's thirty-nine dollars. Which owed him a hundred pence. Probably could have had it by you know if he went to a check cashing place, paid a you know tomorrow, whatever hour it works. I've never used one. He could have paid thirty-nine dollars all day because he owed at that moment. He went out. Same sort of went out. Verse twenty-eight and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a thirty-nine dollars, hundred pence, and he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, "Pay me that thou owest." And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison, a debtor's prison, till he should pay the debt. Now, how could he pay the debt? Verse 30. He can't pay the debt if the guy has him locked up. And I'm going to get on this in a minute. I just have to jump out here right now. That's what forgiveness is. Somebody can never pay you. If you're an unforgiving spirit, you can never get paid the debt. Your dad's dead. Your mom's dead. Your grandma's dead. Your uncle's dead. Your brother is dead. Your ex-boss is dead. But you still hold a grudge. Not because of what they did, but because we have an unforgiving spirit. Yeah. And the Bible takes us to task here. Yeah. In fact, God wants to grab us by the throat. In fact, in a minute, I'll read scriptures where God does say, I'm going to grab you by the throat. I'm going to pin you against the wall. And then we'll see how you act. And we'll know in a minute when we take the Lord's Supper of whether you let the Lord take you by the throat or whether you get on your knees and, and get right with God. The Lord's Supper will be the last thing today. And if you still take the Lord's Supper uh, after the invitation, and the invitation, I hope you're, I want you to think right now, who you got a grudge against? Who is it you can't get over? What thing in your past has caused you to be, become angry and then bitterness? And bitterness is a ruin of many people. Amen. Verse number 31. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry. And, came, uh, and told, came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that, had called him, said unto him, Oh, thou wicked servant. Now, again, I, it seems to me, it doesn't seem to me, here's, my, here's the only interpretation. There is no other interpretation. Well, there's many, one, one uh, the scripture, but many interpretations. There's no more interpretation than this, that God says, if you don't forgive, after all you've been forgiven, you're wicked, wicked, wicked. Now, we may never get through the, the, the text. Because this thing's eating eat me up for a long time. I know few people in this room that have been as hurt as I have by people that I laid down my life for that became unloyal, disloyal. You say, well, who are you talking about? I'm not talking about, I'm talking about people in my heart that I forgave, I forgave, I forgave. They wouldn't have spit on me if I was on fire, yet when they had a need, I, God allowed that need to come to me. I think partially as a test, say, what are you going to do, Jackson? How do you feel? And if you know me, you know in the Jackson family, we don't prize very many character traits higher than loyalty. Love, that's one. Uh, loyalty, 
would be the second. Forgiveness would be in there. It's a big deal with Jackson family, big deal with Doug Jackson anyway about loyalty. I believe in loyalty. You throw me a bone, I'll fight a grizzly bear for you. I don't need somebody to do something for me all the time, all the time, all the time. Do something one time, it gets locked in here. I keep it in my mind. I think on good things. I have good memory. You name the person, I'll give you a good memory. My mom, my dad, people that have been here, people that uh, uh, have um, not left correctly. All right. Why well, have a hard feeling? Why? Because I've been forgiven everything, and I've done the same thing. So, well, you, did you ever do that to somebody? Did you ever hurt somebody the way you've been hurt? Uh, yeah, I hurt Jesus, and I hurt my wife, and I hurt my mother and my father. I've hurt my children. I've hurt some of you. I hurt Mrs. Brown. I hurt Mrs. Van and I'm sure I've hurt many people here. If you come to this church for, oh, I've hurt Brother Joe saying something one time just off the cuff about we were going to win. and I made a comment, and he, he felt like people, um, doesn't matter. I've hurt Brother Joe. I thank God those people forgave me. I thank God Mrs. Brown forgave me. I think, uh, I'm glad Joe forgave me. I'm, I'm glad Kathy forgave me. Everybody sins against somebody. You're not going to go through this planet and never offend somebody. You're not going to go through all have sin and come short of the glory of God. So since we've all sinned, and if you're born again today, God has forgiven all sin that you ever did. He blotted them out under the blood, and yet we're going to still walk around. He's forgiven us a $40 million debt that we could never pay. Yet we'll go out and grab one of our fellow servants, which means just like you are, yeah. by the throat. Bless God, I don't need to say this. Grab me by the throat and see what happens. No, I don't know if I've ever been grabbed by my throat, not by man. And I'm not saying there's a bunch of tough guys could do it, but generally around tough guys, I'm a meek guy. And the quiet guy sitting in the corner say, can I fetch your slippers, sir? <laughs> so his fellow servants, verse 31, saw what was done. They were very sorry and came and told them the Lord all that was done. Then his Lord Sunday called him and said unto him, thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt. Why? Because you asked me to. Because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have had Shouldest that not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord, that would be Jesus, and his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if from your hearts... You forgive not every man his brother their trespasses. Mrs. Jackson and I went to college. I was saved in 1981. I was called to preach when I was 12. We went to college in 19, let's see, called when I was 12. I got saved when I was in 1981. We were married in 1982, and we went to college in 1983. First year I was at college, I was in college, Crown Point, Indiana. Um, I'm, I, of course, a lot of incoming freshmen. Every year you have a lot of freshmen. And since you're a freshman, if you're in the same, uh, bath, uh, we were in uh, pastoral theology, I, I later changed the education, but you're in classes that are, that are designed by the registrar uh, to, to graduate in four years, and it's designed that way. Uh, probably all colleges and universities are, I, I reckon. Um, so I was in class with these guys. We'll call one Jimmy B, we'll call one Jimmy C. There was Jimmy B, Jimmy C, and Dougie J. Only my wife can call me Dougie. Jimmy B and Jimmy C and me. Well, at, uh, um, before church on, on Sunday evenings, Brother House had something called Q&A, question and answer. You could ask, you know, raise your hand, be recognized. You could ask him anything you wanted. You just, whatever. Well, there's a guy there, Jimmy C, had a deep voice. It sounded like he'd get up and say, um, Dr. Hiles, I, I, I wanted to ask you a question out of Leviticus. And uh, Brother Howes, uh, the first few times, uh, you know, we were always there. We never, doors were open. We were in church. Um, he recognized him and said, oh, you got a great preaching voice, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, uh, Brother Calvary's, he would get up every week and ask another question, another question. And there were a lot of college freshmen that would ask questions that were, um, they were lame. They were dumb. It's like, I guess college freshmen was 18, 19 years old. I was 24. We went to school. So I'd been in the military and whatnot, married and had a kid. So I was a little more mature than them. But uh, Brother Calbreeze, oh, I didn't mean to say his last name. Well, you don't know him. Uh, Jimmy C. was friends with Jimmy B. And there were a few other men. And we knew each other. Well, one day, one Sunday, um, Jimmy C. asked a question. Brother Howes gave a, uh, 
an answer. I don't remember the question, don't remember the answer, but I remember people laughed. And oftentimes, Brother Howe, just like I did a minute ago, teasing Alicia and teasing Drew and teasing uh, people, that just how Brother Howe was, how I've been my whole life. So uh, uh, Jimmy C. got, I, I guess, got hurt, offended, ashamed, mad, angry, I'm not sure. Uh, but Jimmy B., my good friend, took up Jimmy C.'s hurt. Uh, same thing happened to me at college. And you've heard me tell before, I was in the balcony sitting there with my wife and daughter. Uh, somebody asked, asked a question to Brother Hiles about uh, where the ashes of a red heifer. Now it's like, come on, man, it's not important. And that was a question that wasn't important theologically. It has no bearing on our life now. Sure, it has some meaning in Scripture, but, you know, I never have found out yet. Don't plan on finding out until I get to heaven. Um, I asked a question. First time I'd ever asked a question, I said, how wide was the Red Sea? where the children of Israel crossed it. Now that's a good Bible question. He didn't know the answer. I know he didn't know the answer because he made some flippant statement about something about the red heifer and the deep, okay, he offended me. I was grown man and in my heart, look, I did, that's not how I grew up. You diss me, bro. Here's what I want to stand and say, Brother Hiles, would you please leave your bodyguards and would you meet me in the alley after church? And I'll ask you that again, and we'll see how you talk to me then. Because I like back in the day, okay, now that's how I felt, and I had a right to feel that way. So here's what I did. I didn't, I didn't keep it inside. I wrote a hot letter. I mean, I wrote a letter like, bro, I don't know who you think you're talking to, but you're going to humiliate me in front of my wife and daughter? That, that's not cool. I, I can't understand a pastor do that. I mean, I laid into Dr. Hyde. Because to me, he wasn't Dr. Jack Isles. He was just this guy that gave me grief. I went to college there because God led me there. I wrote him a hot letter, but as wisdom, I have wisdom. I went to the dean of men. His name is Toby Weaver, and I said, here's what happened. I gave him a letter to read. He read the letter, and it was about one page. I mean, I got to the point, and uh, he laughed. He got to the end. He laughed. He was like, I said, what do you think? He said, I think if you gave that to him, he would buy you a new Bible, because that's what Brother Howells did. If, you, if he found out he hurt you, he'd give you a gift, and I said, well, I don't want to do Bible. He just said, here's what he said. He said, I don't think he meant it. He didn't mean it. He wouldn't hurt you for anything. Okay, that's all I needed. I didn't have to keep that grudge. And, and if you know anything about how I feel about Dr. Hiles, uh, he's been dead for 22 years. Well, he's been more alive than he's ever been for 22 years. And um, I've been a fierce, staunch uh, defender of his and through the years, and you've heard illustration after illustration, and, and I don't mind defending my preachers, and I don't, I, I don't mind that. I don't mind saying, oh, you may have thought you found a soft vanilla pudding Christian, but you better go look someplace. You better go look at the Catholic Church, but you better not look at this homeboy, because I'm not no softy. You say, well, that's not biblical. I know you would never say that, because I think it is biblical. Amen? Back in the day, they had some Mel Trotter at the rescue mission. They call it muscular Christianity. Some drunk came in causing trouble. They'd throw the bum out in the street. Hey, if you want to come in here for soup and salvation and a sandwich and a bed, cool. But if you want to come here and start trouble, we'll, we'll box your ears, bro. We had, they had an ex-heavyweight boxer was their guy that got saved. It's like, bro, that's how you handle your business. Um, that's how it should be handled. And, and so I, 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 I wrote that letter. I was angry. That was on a Sunday night. On Monday, I was in Dean Weaver's office. He, and that was it. From then on out, it was like, okay, I understand. I got better. Jimmy B, Jimmy C got worse and bitter, and Jimmy B picked up his cause, and Jimmy B took up Jimmy C's, and Jimmy B became bitter also. He slowly moved away from the church. Uh, it was in steps. Um, first, he withdrew from school. Secondly, he joined another church. Thirdly, uh, joined another church of not like faith. Well, it was like faith, but it was a different kind of church in Chesterton, Indiana, from where we were out in the Hammond area. Then he moved home back to Maine, where he joined a weak church, and then he quit church. You say, well, how do you know that? Because in 2005, he came here. He was passing through. He's an author now. He writes books on sports. He was a big six-foot-three kid, could throw a baseball like 96 miles an hour. The guy was a beast. He was, and I, I, I love baseball. Uh, we worked on a bus route together. I remember standing on the corner of South Shore in uh, old probably 82nd or 83rd, and him saying, um, uh, I'm going to captain this route someday. And we were rich, fresh workers. I'm going to captain this route someday. And I I remember I laughed, and he said, well, you're laughing like you don't think I can? I said, no, I'm, I'm laughing because I like that. I like boldness. I like 
aggression. I like you saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get the bit in my teeth, and I'm going to serve, and I'm going to work, and, and I'm going to pray, and I'm going to give, and God's going to use me, and I'm going to captain this route someday. And Jimmy B. never did captain a route. Jimmy B. quit on God. And Doug Jackson, who got better, not bitter, became a captain of that route and had incredible relationships and wonderful memories and great stories and many, many hundreds of people brought to church, thousands brought to church, and hundreds born again. The difference between bitter and better. Bitter and better. I owe God 40 mil. Somebody hurts me owes me 30. Brother Howes owes me $39. I can forgive $39. I don't know how to forgive 40 million. Why? Because only God can forgive that 10,000 talent debt we owe. What can wash away our sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So Jimmy comes through here 20 years ago, 21 years ago, 19 years ago, and he called and said he's in town. He was, he was flying through. He rented a car. He came here. We met him right here in the parking lot. I was parked right here. And it was a busy day. It was a nice day. It was a spring day. And, and we were real busy at the church and busy at the school. And, and everybody saying preacher and Pastor Jackson. And, and, you know, we had 45, 50 kids here at school and teachers and the ministry. The doors were open seven days a week. And I was busy. I went to pick up tracks. And Mrs. Jackson had ordered like 10,000 Spanish tracks. And we were only supposed to get 1,000 Spanish tracks. And she was apologetic. And uh, that was a $39 debt she owed me. Uh, and I forget, it was right, there. I would have forgave her whether Jimmy B was in the car or not, but I forgave her, and he was just, he, I could tell, I didn't, I, I didn't ask for it, I didn't want it, I, we were just being us at, at our school, at our church, in our ministry, and he told me before he left, we spent three or four hours together, had lunch, um, he said, you know, Doug, if it would have been like this, I probably would have stayed in church, and he was saying, he was saying something complimentary, and I, and I appreciated it, but I knew, I wanted to say, Jimmy B., you're since past bitter. God didn't send you to a church running 300, a small, you know, for a small church running 300. He didn't send you to me to be your pastor. He sent you to First Baptist Church of Hammond to be trained for the ministry. And maybe one of the most important tests he took was not in history or theology or science or mathematics or English or, or personal evangelism, but the test that God allowed him to have when he became um, incensed at Dr. Hiles, yeah. angry yeah. because Brother Hiles gave a uh, 39, because they elevated Brother Hiles way up here. This is Brother Hiles. He shouldn't talk to us like this. I, I, I elevate Brother Hiles up here. But at the same time, uh, God bless you, Brother Hiles, but dude puts on his britches just like I did. His wife had to do the laundry just like my wife does. He no different than me. I never looked at him like he's way up there. And I think that was a blank. When I went to school at 30, at 24, 25 years old, I was already pretty much kind of like on the direction I was going. And he wouldn't, nothing was going to stop me. I, I got sent me there. I'll speak out. And if he gets mad, so be it. He made me mad. Okay, here's my response. Here's what I have to say. Brother Weaver said, and I understood. I didn't know this. I'd read the passage, I'm sure, but it hadn't stuck in my heart like it did, like I just did while I read the text. Now, what happened to Jimmy B? He came here and he was telling me, not in church. I knew he moved away. He had a boy, a baby boy. They had one. Uh, uh, Jimmy B and Mary B had one son. His name was Mark. He was the apple of his eye. He told me as he was telling me he's not in church. I didn't ask him for this, and he said, and Mark. It went, goes to Boston College at the time. Uh, Mark is an agnostic. Well, an agnostic means an, uh, the agnostic means I don't know. I don't know if there's a God or not. Now, now, mom and dad may say, "Well, we're agnostic too. We just don't know anymore." I, I, I guarantee you, I know their profession. I know those people. They are born again, and when the rapture happens or they die, they they are going to heaven, and their son is going to hell. Now, I pray for Mark, but his name's Mark. Mark B. I prayed for him. I don't even know the guy. I mean, I knew him when he was like a toddler. But if he's still alive he's, and he's not saved, he's lost. If he's married, she's lost. Agnostic boys don't marry Baptist born-again girls usually. If they have children, they're lost. Besides Van Buren's here. <laughs> yeah, but Joe Van Buren, I was just telling Paul, was on enough to sit down and say, I don't know or not, but I'm going to read the Bible and find out for myself. Yeah. Uh, uh, Mark... Uh, B, I'm sure he didn't do that. Why? Because dad turned him away. Because dad got bitter. And, and the Bible says in Hebrews 12, be careful, be careful lest any root of bitterness 
a root's under the ground. Lest any root of bitterness spring up. That's your action verb. Spring up. Sp- wet direction. It springs up suddenly. That's your, that, that tells you how the verb acts. You spring up suddenly, unawares, without notice, without who knows. All of a sudden, pow, and there's bitterness. And the Bible says it will defile many so Jimmy sees an ability, and he should have sat down and shut up anyway. Dr. Hiles. Well, I had this other up. People always say, are you from the south? I'm like, yeah, I'm from the south side of Indianapolis, amen? Actually, I'm from the east side. But I have that kind of a tongue. Uh, it sounds a little southern, and I, I kind of like that. You know, I married a little southern girl there from Kentucky, and uh, I like the south, even though they got whooped in the war. That's for all you rebels, amen. I'm a Yankee. And you know, I was a real strong Yankee until I found out my dad was born in Alabama and my mom was, uh, her family was all from Kentucky. I'm like, well, hmm. And now uh, in the front of my Bible it says, the South's going to rise again. No, I didn't say that. (laughs) Defile many. Now, I could call it, this, this is called harden not your heart. I could have called it how to send your lineage to hell. Number one, I'm going to give you some thoughts. We're going to have Lord's Supper. I'll bet in by five after we'll start the invitation. Number one, forgive immediately. Don't, no, I, I, I'm not going to give you point A, B, 1A, 1B, 1C, 1D. Forgive immediately. Yeah. When he said, uh, I can't pay. I can't pay my sin debt. I'll never be able to pay my sin debt. I can never pay for what I've done. And God says, Jesus said, that's okay. I'm going to, you've asked me, I'll forgive you. He forgave us a $40 million debt, yet somebody owes us $39, which they can pay. But sometimes, you know what we do? We act like a $39. We make a $39 debt a $40 million debt, so they can't pay. How are you going to hold a grudge against your, your your dead parent? Well, you don't know what they did. Yeah, well... I, yeah, get over it. I don't mean to handle that carelessly. I don't mean to act like I, I don't have sympathy. But you're just still carrying a grudge and a hatred and a bitterness. My mom did this. My dad did this. Doesn't matter if your dad was a pimp and your mom was a prostitute and your, 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 your uh, a brother-in-law was a Catholic priest and his wife was another Catholic priest. <laughs> I can be worse. I got to answer for the transgender crowd. Go in the bathroom and figure it out. Do you sit down? You're a girl. Do you stand up? You're a boy. Oh, that's kind of crude. Really no different than what they teach in our schools. In fact, far better. And I've been saying that for 20 years. That's not anything new. $39 debt we can't forgive. Oh, they did this. Oh, they did that. Forgive immediately. No, you don't have to have a reason why. Forgive immediately. Here's why. Number two, forgive repeatedly. Every single time you get offended against, that's an opportunity for you to show love to God. Every time you get offended, say, I'm going to forgive that. 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 Forgive every time. Forgive immediately. How? By number three, as you forgive immediately and repeatedly, you develop a pattern, a character trait. You begin to have a character trait of forgiveness. Every time you come to that fork in the road, either I'll forgive or I won't. I'll forgive or I won't. And it may start off like this, but eventually as time goes on, you're headed in a certain direction or you're headed in a certain direction. It becomes easier to forgive or more difficult to forgive. Yeah. Why? You say it's harder now than it used to be. It's easier to forgive than it once was. It's harder to forgive than it's ever been. Why? Because you start off in that direction. You yeah. did, we haven't learned to forgive immediately. Right. We haven't for, uh, learned to forgive repeatedly. And we haven't developed that habit, a pattern, a character trait. Number four. Um, um, uh, uh, forgive immediately and repeatedly and make it a habit so we are forgiven. Yeah. What's the Lord's Prayer say? Uh, for, forgive us our trespasses as we, there's again a verb, just like we, Lord, forgive us how we sin against you, just like we forgive those who sin against us. And if we don't forgive those who sin against us, does God forgive our sin? Yes, the Bible says in Hebrews uh, and other places, Our sins and iniquities, he'll remember them no more. He's cast them behind the depths of the sea. They're blotted out by the blood. Uh, Our uh, Heavenly Father uh, is paid in full. That's what it says in my record in heaven. By the blood of Jesus Christ, paid in full. I'm going to heaven. I have assurance. I can't lose it. But I can carry around a load of sin. I can carry around that weight of unforgiveness. So while I am forgiven as far as my uh, eternal standing, my destination... 
I still carry that unforgiveness in my heart, and I know you, you can't go and say, oh, God, I know that I've sinned. I've sinned against you. Please forgive me. Thank you. And God says, what about so-and-so? You know if it's in your heart or not. We ought to be able to sing, nothing between my soul and the Savior. Amen. Nothing. Number one. Forgive immediately. Number two, forgive repeatedly. Number three, when you do these things, it creates a habit, a pattern, a character trait. Uh, conversely, as I said, if you don't forgive, you're developing another character trait. Yeah. You know, people that don't forgive are some of the hardest people to get along with. Some of the most grouchiest, grumpiest, negative. When you don't, when you don't, so forgive because you're forgiven. Number five, forgive so we can understand the Savior better. So we can be closer to him, yeah. to his great heart. Seven sayings on the cross. One of them, you know it. Father, he said, he prayed as he was suffering the agonies of the cross. Father, forgive them. Who? Them. The very ones that have crucified me, denied me. People in that crowd that he had fed, that he'd worked miracles for. Yeah. People that should love him. Maybe even people that believed in him. But peer pressure is something. And, he, and God, and I think Jesus said, man, this peer pressure, the Romans, the situation they're in with the, with, under the law and the Pharisees. Father, forgive them. They, they don't know what they're doing on the cross. Father, forgive them. When you forgive a hard hurt, a, a bad hurt, much wrong, you can know more the Savior better. Now, I need to read this quickly. Number six, forgive so you don't get sick and die taking the Lord's Supper. Here's what the Scripture teaches us. We're taking it this morning in a minute. Um, here's what it says. For, um, for I have received of the Lord... That which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body. Luke, hand me one of those, quick. As fast as you can. Son, put it down. I'll get it. Reach in there and hand me a piece of bread. Today, where the rapture happened, set it down, cover back up. Co boy, cover back up, just like you, just like you found it. Now, hand me a juice. Please, sir, on this hand. And then put the lid back. Thank you, sir. Careful, careful, careful. Okay, good boy. Good man. Here's what the Bible says. The same night, the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread and was given thanks. He broke it. It was a loaf. He broke it.